So today, I'm going to introduce a set of very powerful tools that let us deal with one of the most fundamental questions in so describing, characterizing complex spatial and temporal systems. Um, we've seen hints of some of the structure uh, that sort of underlies information theory, but today I'm going to pull it out rather directly. So again, the way to think about this is, you know, we have the, the Cover and Thomas Elements of Information Theory book, and that's partly measures of information, entropy, mutual information, conditional entropies, and another part, and probably uh, the dominant part of the book, and maybe the most important technologically are in the communication channels. So t this week we're going to more focus on the first side, measures of information, and introduce uh, very handy graphical technique called information diagrams that is, uh, in uh, strictly speaking, not necessary from the mathematical analytical point of view, but is such a powerful intuition that you can actually solve many questions. Interestingly, it poses a number of sort of problems as you develop these information diagrams for, in different settings that you actually lead you to sort of new ideas, interesting things. So. So the goal this week is to deepen our sense of information processing, what kinds of information there are. Just like last week, we sort of ended on talking about um, new things. So proxies for information storage like the excess entropy, um, transient information for synchronization, like that kind of thing. Um, now we're going to basically look underneath and try to set up some more um, helpful tools as we deal with sort of arbitrary weight correlations in systems. So this is, this is the key problem. How do you measure correlations in a system? And what do you mean by correlation? Very, very, very often what you see is people, in fact the word correlation in physics is synonymous with a two-point relationship between variables you've picked. And there's a thing called a correlation function which, you know, in time, that I think before you transform that you get your power spectral density out. And, but it's all based on two-point statistics. If it was a spin system, probability of having upspin here, upspin here, downspin here, upspin here, downspin here as a function of distance, but just two-point statistics. Yeah. yeah, the dominant notion we have of correlation is just between two points in the system. Of course, if you're talking about two-point correlation, what you're forgetting is the state of the variables all in between the two points you're, you're talking about. So there's a lot of statistics that you, you leave out, a lot of statistical properties, correlations, and structure you leave out. So, um, in, in a sense, uh, what I'm going to introduce today really brings us up the research frontier. This issue of what correlation is in a group of random variables is still very much a debate in the research frontier. Um, Certainly a, a general answer to that. Right. So, so, if I were just to give you a basket of, of random variables, you might have, at least at this point, some natural questions. Like, how much information do they share? So far, We've just talked about mutual information between two variables. And, you know, it was used in information theory, communication theory, to be the input and output of a channel, and mutual information was related to the channel utilization or capacity. But if I just give you a basket of random variables, how are they correlated? And what does it mean to have a three-way correlation, a four-way correlation? So the sciences and mathematical statistics have these ways of providing all these alternative models that just deal with single variables or pairwise statistics. Um, so today I'm going to hint at what the, the directions of a general solution to this question. And that comes from generalizing um, Shannon's measure of information to what we call information measures and then this developing this graphical tool that lets us deal with what ends up being kind of a combinatorial explosion of all the different relationships you can have. But you'll see in two, three, and four variable cases it's a very useful tool, even five variable case, we can make a lot of progress. Okay, so now a little bit of review. So I'm going to step back uh, to get a running start at this. So, so we just had a single random variable given by some distribution. Um, sort of the, the use paradigm for this is that I have a random variable sitting there. Could be a coin, could be some experiment I'm running. Um, and I imagine that there's this one observable and I keep coming back sampling it. In particular, the sampling process itself how I'm accessing random variables IID. And in that setting, Shannon suggests that we use the entropy to measure the amount of surprise, the degree of randomness, 
the flatness of the distribution over possible events, and so on. Okay. Now, if we have two variables, say x and y, governed by their marginals and also by a joint distribution, of course, we have the joint entropy. Well, that's sort of understandable from the previous single variable case because then we imagine that the joint two variables uh, provide joint events. So we just have this one big distribution we plug into the previous formula and we get this joint entropy. But then we have more interesting things talking about the relationship between variables, the uncertain x and y, the uncertain y given x. Uh, we have this mutual information between the two, and then also this distance between the two distributions that govern uh, the, the observables x and y. And then I introduced, if you recall, this diagram, mostly just as kind of a roadmap, because I had developed a whole bunch of different kinds of information identities, and this diagram lets us read those things off. So we have, think of this like a Venn diagram. This is the set of events x can take on. But then the size of it is actually the entropy of the distribution over those events. Uh, we can have another variable y in yellow here. The size of that is the entropy. Then the joint distribution is the whole thing here. Without double counting the overlap, we count the overlap just once. That's the joint entropy. We have the uncertainty in x given y. We think of that as sort of set subtraction. We have x. We hack off the piece that's y. The remaining crescent is the, represents the conditional entropy, conditional uncertainty of x given y. And symmetrically, for y given x, we have y, we hack off a piece of x, and that yellow crescent is the conditional entropy of y given x. We have the mutual information. Again, now the information builds up. That's exactly the overlap. It's the size in the sort of vent space of the overlap between the two different random variables, the sort of shared information. And then we have this distance metric, which is just the sum of the two outer crescents. OK, so that's very nice. And then you can talk about how you, know, you can see how the mutual information uh, is, for example, h of x plus h of y minus the joint. Right? I have h of x plus h of y. Well, I've actually overcounted the, 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 the overlap here twice, and then I subtract off the joint, and that leaves one copy of this shared area, which is the mutual information of x and y. So a lot of those identities, I mean, this is the easiest thing to remember. <laughs> you don't have to hold the individual identities in your head. You just think about this and kind of go back and forth. And so again, we're, not, we're, we're talking about distributions you know, over x and y, joint distribution marginal distributions. We're not having to carry around these bags of all these probability amplitudes. We just have this nice geometric picture based in terms of the scalar, and now it's a little more graphical than that. It's the size of a set. Yeah? So it's going to be x given complement of y and y given complement of Yes, right. We'll, we'll get to that. I, I have to bring out, to, to, to talk about the generalization, I have to bring out the set theoretic analogy more directly. So we will do that in probably in too much detail, but yeah, we'll get there. Yeah. Okay, so, so is this, well, I kind of gave away the punchline. Is this, is this just some sort of cute mnemonic shorthand for doing things? In fact, it's not. It's, it's actually uh, a hint that there's a, a, a lot, a great deal more structure underneath when we use information theory to describe processes and complex systems. Okay, so now start pushing head to three variables. So x, y, and z governed by this joint distribution over all three of them. Um, so now let's think about what, what possible information quantities could there be. Well, again, we can think of this as a single triplet event, and therefore the joint entropy makes sense. We just plug that in. So, so that kind of readily comes to mind. We have no trouble with that. But now, what, what set of conditional entropies do we have? We have all these possible qu it's questions we could ask. Um, the uncertainty x, so we have kind of a single variable conditional entropies and uncertainty x, y, and z, given that you know the complement of them, the other variables. Uh, we can look at the joint entropy in pairs, conditioned on the remaining variables, so uncertainty of the joint events x and y, given z, and so on. Okay, so suddenly, rather than just two conditional entropies, we have six little hints at how the complication is going to arise. Uh, we should expect this, right? I mean, it's, 
It's not going to be a simple question if I have a bunch of random variables, what are the relationships? There will be combinatorial possible ways of these things interacting, so, so I'd expect this. Um, we've also worked a little bit with the conditional mutual information in a couple different settings. One was, for example, talking about the data processing inequality or Markov chains. We had this notion of shielding. So what's the mutual information between uh, x and y, given we know z? And if it's a Markov chain, x goes to z, goes to y, z shields x from y. So if the right variables were a Markov chain, this mutual information would be zero, given uh, the intervening variable between them. So that, that makes some sense. It's just you know, what we're familiar with, it, the two variable mutual information that conditioned on some third variable's information that might render them. Uh, say independent, as in the case of the Markov chain. <sighs> what about mutual information though for three variables? So this is the first interesting uh, thing that we'll, we'll analyze. Um, it takes a little while to get back to answering the question, but what, what, is, what is a three-way mutual information? So again, we're using the semicolons here, just kind of democratically presented here. What does it mean for three things to have to share information? We got we developed some intuition for the, the two variable mutual information, um, and then I don't know. <laughs> it makes sense that there's a distance between two variables that d of x y we had before. I don't know what it would mean for three. So this maybe it's just an open question. What could that be? It was sort of all of the unshared information um, before the outside crescents. So maybe so so you could. Use analogies with a two-variable case to extend to three variables, and we're going to actually do that in, uh, in a couple of situations. But generally, how are we going to deal with this? How are we going to visualize things? Uh, what, what sort of uh, is there a similar kind of roadmap that we just had for the two-variable case? And then, of course, for n variables, we're now expecting this to get kind of messy. So the, the, the agenda for today is to introduce the mechanics of these information variables for arbitrary number of variables. Um, well, okay, now I say arbitrary number of variables. We're going to deal with three and four variable cases in some detail, develop some intuition. And then this information diagram is going to come help us from having to write down tons of algebra. For example, to figure out what the information kind of relationships and identities are. Okay, so a few kind of few observations, and then we'll kind of get into a technical part of introducing this. So there's this kind of maybe it's relabeling things initially. The Shannon information measures, um, uh, and these are entropy of a variable, conditional entropies, mutual informations, and conditional mutual informations. So these are the things we're sort of interested in when we talk about Shannon information. And if you play around enough, or look at that the Venn diagram we had before. Um, realize that all these information measures can be expressed as linear combinations of each other. So, for example, in this case, linear combinations, I can take the information measures and express them as linear combinations of just entropies of sets. Okay, so the uncertainty of x given y is the marginal uncertainty of x minus the joint entropy between x and y. I'm just recalling some of this. In mutual information, I can sum up the marginal entropies minus the joint entropy. And then the, uh, this, this information metric was the sum of the marginal or conditional entropies, sorry, conditional entropies, and so on. So obviously there are relationships between these things. And it turns out this is the general case, which means there's a lot more structure in these diagrams. So in fact, think a little more about it. There's really no fundamental difference between entropy as a measure of uncertainty and the mutual information. There's this stuff out there. We'll just call it information. And uh, you could even sort of, you know, reformulate the way we introduced the entropy by defining it as a self-mutual information. Remember, this before was just this kind of property of mutual information I just introduced in passing. So in fact, I could just start with this mysterious quantity i, define this other function I use sometimes, h, just when we're looking at this shared information between the variable and itself. So self-mutual information. So there's really nothing fundamentally different about h and i. In fact, probably I should just change the notation at this point and just use one variable. I won't, but just say i, information. I can have i of x, which would have been past h of x. 
So there's really just a single quantity being referenced here. Uh, the notation comes from the use context they were introduced in, but it's not really fundamentally different. Okay, so, so this information measure turns out, now for some of the mathematical definitions and a theorem or two, these information measures form what's called a signed measure over event space. So let me say something a little bit about vocabulary here. <laughs> the, the word measure is being used in two cents. Up until this point, I've been saying measure as if it's information quantity, in that sense. But here, when I say measure, this is really a concept from measure theory, from probability theory. So I'll define what that means in this, in this case. OK, so the first thing we should do is need some notation for the events that correspond to random variable. And I'll just put a tilde over the random variable to mean a set of events over which the random variable is defined. Um, the sort of universal set of all possible events is just the union of these things. Okay, so that's kind of the universe of discourse. And just as a kind of a simple uh, operation, I can develop what's called the sigma field. This comes out of measure theory, terminology from measure theory. But the basic idea is very simple. I take the sets of events and I take all possible unions, all possible intersections between the event sets and their complements. In other words, I'm trying to break these up as much as we can. It's as if it was a partition, and I was trying to refine a partition to get to the smallest elements that, that uh, can be formed, smallest so-called atoms, subsets. Okay. And then the measure itself is going to be this real-valued function on the atoms. That's how we're going to define it. So the main uh, 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 mapping is here. You can go through and just define what this, this real valued number is that we're attaching to sets in the following way. Things familiar. So this measure, whatever it is, of the union of the event sets of two random variables, that number is going to be the joint entropy over the two. Um, the sort of size, if you will, the measure of the x event set is going to be the uh, entropy, the marginal entropy of x, same thing for y. Size of the y set, according to mu, is just going to be uh, the, the entropy of y. I'm, when I take the size of the intersection, that's going to be the mutual information. So you should be thinking back to the previous diagram. Um, I look at the set difference between x's event set and y's event set. That's going to be the conditional entropy. Same thing the other way around. Conditional entropy of y given x is going to be the opposite set subtraction. And then uh, I have here this, I take the intersection of these two and then a complement of that. And that's going to be the sum of the conditional entropies, which is the distance measure d. And just to complete things for boundary conditions, the size of the null set that, that mu assigns is zero. Okay. So, and then this operation here, just to be clear, I think we can reformulate it down here in terms of intersections and complements of sets. So, so this is the mapping between, the, on the one hand, the well, first the kind of set theoretic manipulations we've seen already, and then we're, we're adding a size to them, giving a measure to the sets, and then giving a meaning to that size, namely these various ent entropies. Mutual information is conditional entropies. So there's pretty much this, this kind of direct mapping. Anytime you write down uh, some sort of information identity or some expression in terms of entropies and mutual informations, you can just almost do a syntactic replacement on what you wrote down. Right? So H and I turn into this measure that we're looking for, comma, you know, H of X comma Y. Think of that like a programming expression. What that means is union over the event set semicolon is intersection, mutual information, right? And then bar conditioning is set subtraction. So, so this is not, the previous diagram is not some mere graphical help. It is that, but there's a much deeper um, level of structure in this. So just, just to say this, kind of, this mapping clearly, if I write out some information identity like this, mutual information is the sum of the marginals minus the joint. Well, I just rewrite that using this to the mu of the intersection of, of x and y events is equal to the measure of x plus the measure of y minus the measure of the union of the two. And then down at the set theoretic level, we have this intersection is a union minus 
yeah. Right, well, okay, that, that, that's a complement, right? So, wait a second. That should be. doesn't strike me as right. Sorry. Okay. So, um, okay. So, so why, why, why do this? Well, first of all, we're defining this over arbitrary numbers of variables. So there's at least the hope that we can go to n variables. It gives us some picture about how to extend these things. Remember, even for three variables, we didn't really know what that three variable mutual information was between x, y, and z. So maybe that's some help with that. Um, well, directly just makes explicit this, this the, the structure. There are fewer degrees of freedom than one might imagine in, in playing with information uh, quantities. Um, it gives us a way of actually calculating things, reading off uh, different kinds of identities in terms of if sometimes in some problems it's easier to do the calculation over the sets of events rather than information measures and vice versa. Um, it's not always <laughs> a benefit. In particular, there is this sort of combinatorial explosion in, in information measures, but that's actually not its fault. But sometimes it's easier to work with this information measure view, sometimes it's not. Um, and I have probably said this before, it's, it's in turning the crank, once we made the mechanism, uh, the calculus of this, these information identities clear, sometimes it's natural, interesting questions fall out and we can discover new kinds of thing, like new kinds of information, which will be sort of the topic today and, and then Thursday. So how are we going to do this? So I just want to go through the sort of main claim about this, um, mostly to uh, give a tour of it without proving, going through the proofs. So how are we going to define it? So I, this information measure for n variables? Well, first thing is uh, I'm going to just drop the tildes. You have to kind of know from context whether I'm talking about the random variable, the ith random variable, or the event set for the ith random variable. So I want to uh, the W be some collection of these event sets, n of them, for n random variables. We have the, the universal set, okay, just like we had before, but we're just talking about two variables there. And then we have uh, so so this is called the sigma field. This set of, of um, that's generated by this set of random variables, and you form that by all possible intersections of the random variable event sets or their complement. So these individual things are the atoms. There is an exponential number of these atoms as uh, the n grows, so it gets quite large. Yeah? Um, just for intuition, is there any deep way of thinking about the elements of the universal set? Um, no, not independent because what will be left over will be, a, it's almost like the, 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 the atoms will be the, so the most highly conditioned pieces. So, so uh, we'll, we'll give the a bunch of... The atoms are subsets of that space and effectively the elements of the space, right? So, uh, let me push a little bit further and then there'll be some diagrams. We, we kind of point at things, you go, know, like, what does that mean? So, yeah. Yeah. Here we're just, I'm just turning the crank. I mean, I, I just kind of introduce things talking about two variables, and I'm just going to give the notation and lingo for uh, n variables here. Uh, right, so we have an exponential growing number of possible atoms, these residual sets. I'll think of all possible uh, intersections. Remember back to when we made partitions and did the refined partition? The finest elements in the refined partition are with a bit kind of analog of these, these atoms here, except now it's not a consistent partition coming from generating partition, uh, it's any variables you want. It's all possible set intersections. And then, uh, the, and then the number of sets, really the power set, is going to be 2 to 2 to the n. So we'll be talking about a uh, set of random variables. We find these, these elemental pieces called atoms. And then we're, we also want to talk about subsets of that, which is called a power set. I have a set, the set of all possible subsets is called a power set. So that the size of the sigma field is, is doubly exponential on the number of variables. Again, this will be more, more concrete. Yeah, go ahead. So it seems like you're including the intersections of the, of 
Uh, yeah, you can. I mean, it might be n empty. Yeah. yeah. So this is just first turn the crank. Yeah. 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 Okay. So so the 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 main result is this. It's it's sort of notation heavy. It's really no different than what we talked about before. But basically, all the setup, the mappings we made from 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 uh, sets and measures measures being the entropies and so on, and the structure of how the, uh, we're taking marginal, joint, conditional, and mutual informations, that relates back to the set structure. So now we just imagine, to set this up, that we have three different uh, subsets of random variables here, just to state the properties. Then generally, the idea is that if we union the variables in any one set, that that's essentially the, the joint entropy. So I'm kind of adding a little bit of notation here. Um, right, so this is this is the the uh, joint entropy of X, where X is in the set G. So this is all the variables in set G. Um, then we have the the, the, the union here uh, of these variables in G and G prime. We look at the set difference, and that's the sort of this generalized conditional entropy measure of X given Y, where all the X's are picked from subset G. The y's are picks from subset G prime. Um, yeah. The W is uh, just the set of variables. So variables x1 up to xn. So I have a set of n random variables. Or here what I mean actually is the uh, event set associated with the random variable. I dropped the twiddle because it just got too busy. So, so, so here, when x shows up in a set theoretic, and I'm t when x sub i is there in the context of a set, then it means the events associated with that random variable. When it shows up inside of an i or an h function, then it's a random variable. Okay. Anyway, you can sort of see what's going on here. <clears throat> um, I take this, basically, all the uh, random variables in G, union those, all the random variables in G prime union knows. I look at the intersection, and then that corresponds to this uh, mutual information between the variables in set G and the variables in set G prime. Right, so I have in my n variables, I have two subsets G and G prime, and I'm asking what's the mutual information between those two sets. And then uh, <coughs> the final thing we need is a, con is a conditional mutual information, which just is the previous mutual information and then a set difference with a third random variable that comes from some other subset G double prime. So we get this mutual information of the variables in G with variables in G prime condition on knowing the variables in G double prime there. Okay. So the claim is that this mapping is unique assignment, a unique measure on, on the event sets. That's consistent with the Shannon's information measures. Okay, so when it takes, it just will take some time to prove that. Um, probably would take a lecture or so to really flesh it out. That's it's covered in the paper by Jung. That was in the readings. But so much for that. Let's get back to uh, thinking about how to work with this more concretely. Um, and so, so it turns out that there are generalized Venn diagrams implicit in what, what we just set up. Um, crudely speaking, right, the, the area is going to be something like an information measure or an entropy. Conditioning is area removal, subtraction, subtraction, mutual information is intersection. <coughs> and a really important thing, and I'll, I'll do an example here, this measure can be negative. So for two variables, everything we've been working with so far, entropy, mutual information, it's all been non-negative. Well, as soon as we move to three and more variables, it gets, let's say, more interesting. So some of these quantities we just defined implicitly in the previous slides, these measures are actually negative. So, um, uh, however, you know, if, if, if a set actually is, has zero area, then the measure is zero, or zero entropy. So at least there's that. But there's a slight sort of difference uh, 
And it's not the, the measure setup is not introducing negativity. That's already in information theory when we start dealing with three and more variables. So we're going to have to maybe work a little bit to understand what that means. So just to go through all that formal notation explicitly again with a familiar case. So we, we have two random variables, x and y, in a joint distribution. We have these seven possible information measures, just possible subsets I could pull out. So this would be this is associated with the sigma field over the event sets for x and y. And then we have three atoms. These are like the elementary pieces. Like the conditional entropies, h of y given x, and h of x given y, and then the mutual information. So now, with, with this in mind, we can just go back to this setup before. So that's x, that's y, right? The, the joint entropy is this piece plus this piece plus this piece. We don't double count. Now, right, the red part, hack, uh, the yellow part, that's uncertainty of y. x given y, symmetrically for y given x. And then we have the mutual information, which is just the overlap. And then the two crescents are in this case. So, so now, that's very familiar. We're going to do this for three variables. And the question is, what, what, what new thing do we get out of this? Turning the crank. OK, so x, y, and z will be the three variables. Then the joint distribution. And you could write out all possible, think of just like with h's and i's and bars and commas and semicolons, what you could write out. That was sort of a well-formed expression. So there's a lot of things to write out here, going from the marginals to the joint, and somewhere between you have the three-way mutual information, the conditional mutual information, and so on. Conditional entropies, like I wrote up before. Um, oh yeah, and then the, but it turns out there are just seven atomic information measures. So there's a little bit of simplicity here. So so this is what we have. Okay, rather than write this out, I mean, one could write all this stuff out in terms of information identities. Best here. Um, and the theorem shows that this will be a consistent representation of the information measures. Okay, so here's x, y, and now z is the new variable. And I put three circles here, and the way I place the circles, it allows each of the random variables to have all possible intersections and non-intersections with other random variables. So there's a piece of x, y, and z that doesn't overlap any other place. There's a piece that overlaps between x and z, between x and y, between z and y, and then there's a part that overlaps all three. Okay, so now you can kind of imagine, like, what's this up here? What would, what would this blue scallop piece be? Well, that's h of z conditioned on x and conditioned on y. Okay. h of y conditional on x and z, that's this piece here, same thing for x. Okay, uh, let's see, so, so, so what, would, what would this piece be here? Right, that's an intersection between z and x, that would be the mutual information, two variable mutual information between x and z, two variable mutual information between z and y, two variable mutual information between x and y here, but what's this piece? It's a mutual information between z and x conditioned on x. The mutual information between x and z conditioned on y. Right. So it's very mechanical what we're doing here. But, but the, the set structure, just, just read it off. There's not a whole lot of thinking when you do this. Okay. And then. This is, this, is, this is the mystery quantity. What's that? We've defined it just by doing the Venn diagram, but now we actually have a candidate for what the three-way mutual information is. It's some information measure that all three variables contribute to. Yeah? I'm just wondering, is, is there an order of operations or anything on here? Because we have the conditional. Is, can you read that also as? Mutual information of y and z given x, or is it ah like yes right? Yeah, I keep wanting to find an actual grammar parsing for a parser on this. Yeah, so so the question is when when I write down uh, uh, these symbols, is there some sense of order operator 
operator precedence. Just like if I have x times y plus z times has a, is evaluated first according to a compiler. Mm -hmm. right? so, so are there implicit, implicit parentheses here? So um, uh, semicolon has precedence over bar. It groups them. So, so you, I mean, you could, in fact, it wouldn't be a bad idea if it's a little bit confusing to just go ahead and group with parentheses. It'd be perfectly consistent for me to put parentheses in to just indicate that that's. Um, same thing with comma. Comma has higher precedence than, than bar. Um, that's implicit in all those definitions we did, but it could be made more explicit, yeah. But it, but it is different. Yes, yes, right, right. And right, and again, if you get confused, especially with like four or five variables, sometimes I just write in parentheses because I will forget. Or sometimes there'll be expressions you can write out that are a little bit ambiguous, so, so don't hesitate to add some notation to make that clear. Say, say again? The difference between a semicolon and what? And a comma. They both sort of join, right? Join the probability and the join distribution. Uh, yeah, it, I think the honest answer to the difference between the semicolon and a comma is that um, that's the way Shannon introduced them. <laughs> and, and, and it's kind of like there's a bit of, of uh, uh, Overrepresentation. We have two symbols I and H that give the context of the interpretation of the symbols. So you could imagine developing a consistent notation where if I had I in front, then a comma over here would mean kind of that group of variables I'm doing the mutual information over. However, like you saw before, we can have mutual information between two variables and then other variables separated by commas here, sort of individually. So it, it, it is consistent. It's just um, there's, I'm not aware of anyone who's bothered to make this syntactically uh, cleaner like that. But um, Right, so, so this tends to mean um, union. It doesn't tend to mean. In, in this mapping, which is now making this, 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 these questions clear, this means union. And then the semicolon means intersection between the sets, the, the associated event sets. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, but you could imagine, uh, yeah, but now we have I and H's, um, I, yeah. that would be one thing to get rid of, I think. You could just, you can pretty much tell what you're doing if I were to draw these based on the syntax internally, so there might be some confusing cases, but. Um, now, okay, so what good is this? Well, uh, we can... Actually, th this is a whole set of questions, right? Th this represents a large number of information identities that you can just read off, right? Um, uh, right, the mutual information between X and Z is three-way mutual information plus the mutual information between X and Z given Y. Um, um, this quantity, this three-way mutual information, this new thing that we're going to probe a little bit, it's a little odd uh, um, um, in some cases, uh, but I just kind of described before, it's the information that all variables contribute to. It's also symmetric, right? There, there are different expansions of this. I can write this out in a couple different ways. I can have the mutual information between X and Z and subtract off this piece to get here. And similarly here, the mutual information between y and z and subtract off this piece to get here and so on. So suddenly, at least we can realize that whatever this three-way mutual information is, it's, it's very symmetric. That helps us maybe move a little step closer to understanding what it means. Yeah? I have a question. Yeah. So what's the uh, definition of the three-way uh, mutual information in terms of the probability of distribution of the x, y, z? Uh, well, here, just expand out, right? We have, a, we, have you, you, we know what the definition is of, X, of mutual information x and y, and then we know what it is here. We just put in the conditioning, right? So here, the mutual information was usually a joint over the marginals. 
So now I have a joint conditioned on Z and marginals conditioned on Z. You just, you just, just read this right off. Oh, you can. Well, no, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I, here, here, here are three definitions <laughs> that you can immediately translate back. What you're probably asking for is what is somehow, um, what does it look like altogether without going back to the more familiar two variable definitions? And I'll, I'll, I'll we'll, we'll get to that. In fact, we're going to generalize. Well, we're going to talk about what n-way mutual information could mean. And it turns out this is just one kind. So, and then I'll give you more explicit expressions in terms of the probabilities. Okay, so now the important thing about this, this uh, moving to three variables in terms of, especially in terms of the intuitions we've developed, we now have to unlearn something. Namely, that this three-way mutual information, unlike two-way mutual information and one variable entropy, can be negative. So here's the, this is the canonical example. Coburn and Thomas go through this. We have X and Y, both fair coins, Bernoulli random variables. They're independent of each other. It's two separate coins. And then I'm going to form a third random variable, Z, which is just some mod 2 of X and Y. Simple enough. This is actually how our friend, the random random XOR process was made. Except this was done in a slight window. Two coin flips, the third one. At the next time, it is the sum mod 2 or XOR of that. OK, so now we can calculate out what's going on. Well, by definition, X and Y were independent fair coins, so their mutual information is 0. Uh, so we can calculate this out. We just kind of expand until there's a quantity that you know. So we can look at the, the mutual information we X and Y conditioned on Z, the inputs conditioned on knowing the output. Well, just information identity, which we could read off. Before, so that's just the uncertainty of x given z minus the uncertainty of x given y and z. Well, if you think a little bit about the sum mod 2 operation, um, if I know the output and, and, and because of the sum, mod 2 loses information, I don't know what x is going to be. It doesn't determine x, so there's one bit of uncertainty in x, even if I know what the output of sum mod 2 is. However, if I know any two of the variables, in this case the output plus y, then I exactly know what x is. I can invert that sum mod 2 operation to figure out what x has to be to make z what it is. So we have one bit of mutual information. OK, so first curious thing, they were independent. And then I gave you some additional information about them. I had an observable, which is sum mod 2. And that induces an apparent correlation between them. Up here, we didn't know that. Here we do. Okay. Now, the punchline is we can use the previous uh, identities to look at the three-way mutual information. <clears throat> well, one of those was just the two-way mutual information between x and y minus the two-way mutual information between x and y conditioned on z. We just plug in here 0 minus 1. So it's negative. So I'm not familiar with uh, a nice narrative explanation for what it means to be negatively correlated. Um, our intuitions from conventional negative correlation don't quite apply. Um, people are actually working on this right now. There's one response to three variable negative information measures and more variables um, to try to come up with a completely different mathematical framework where all the quantities are positive. And that has been, well, in short, not successful been very active last three or four years, not successful at all. In fact, a couple of people thought they had it, and then just about a year ago, counterexamples were, were developed. So my inclination is just to work with it. So we will. Now, what's this look like? So we just went through this calculation. Well, I just claim these information diagrams are helpful. Let's see what that looks like with the information diagram. So x, x y, and z. Um, OK, so I just went through and calculated all of the quantities. Uh, right? So this is mutual information of x and z conditioned on y. That was one I went through. I just calculated it out. And there's our minus one we just calculated. Uh, 
If I specify any two random variables, the third one is predictable. Specify any two random variables, the third one is predictable. Okay. So I just kind of filled in. So each one of the atoms here has its measure. So notice that we also know that the marginal of x, marginal entropy of y and z, those are one. Just look at those one variables. They're, they're Bernoulli. So does that, is that consistent with it? Sure. 0 plus 1 minus 1 plus 1 is 1. Ditto everybody else here. Okay. We also noted that the two-way mutual informations are all 0. Pairwise, the variables are all independent. So what piece is that? Well, the mutual information between y and z is this shape right here. And notice, 1 plus minus 1 is 0. So, oh, right. Yeah, so, so that's um, an indication, especially if you're doing problems, that the, the roadmap is very easy. You just kind of lay these things out. It's a little bit of crank turning to calculate the atomic values, information measure each of the values, but then you can answer a number of questions for that. So, so it's interesting how with a signed measure like this, a piece of the subdiagram will then indicate that one of the atoms in the mutual information between x and z could be zero. But somehow, if you had more information, suddenly this breaks into a negative and a positive contribution. OK, so now, uh, just to kind of exercise some of this, um, I mentioned just before a Markov chain. So you remember a Markov chain, you know that x goes to y goes to z, and there's this notion of shielding. If I fix y, z, and x are independent, okay. and we express that this way, the consequence is that mutual information between x and y condition between x and z condition on y is zero. Okay, so question: How does that change our general three-variable I diagram? Well, that's an atom, right? That's x and z, x and z conditioned on y. So that's this guy. And that should be 0. Actually, I did this backwards. Sorry. x and z. <laughs> right. So mutual information between x and z would be this big piece here. And then I condition on y up here. I take that off. So that atom is this guy. So it's 0 for a Markov chain. OK. So what I'm going to do is just go through and calculate. So identify the atoms here. And then change the diagram to reflect that this guy is 0. All right. And then here, so I just took y and kind of moved it down, and now that lower atom has disappeared. So we have just one less uh, atom in the whole diagram. We have six other atoms in here. Uh, we had seven before. Um, so now this kind of takes on this sort of fanful kind of picture. In fact, sort of visually, if I say, oh, y shields z from x, it's sort of clear in the diagram. There is no overlap between x and z that doesn't go through y. Therefore, if I fix y, they can't see each other. Okay. That the blue here shields them from each other. In addition, and this takes just a little more work, all of the remaining atoms, for when we have a Markov chain, all of these are positive. All the atoms are positive or zero. So, so that's nice. So, so in a Markov chain, for example, when we're dealing with the time series, uh, we have a less complicated information diagram because of the shielding property. So this would be true of a Markov chain, for example. The state variables in a Markov chain obey this. So now you should imagine not just three of these, x1, x2, x3, but a whole chain and this kind of infinite kind of lattice information diagram. And this is probably a better way to think about a chain like that. So the perfectly uh, a set theoretic equivalent to the previous one, but just sort of laid out. But here's y. And again, you can see how it shields z from x. And then this you can imagine just drawing these humps off. So this is, this is kind of hinting at how we're going to deal with time series and information in time series is thinking this way. Um, 
although um, there is a first cut at using the information diagrams that gives a lot of simplicity to think about processes. So, so rather than, so what we're going to do is now think about processes that we have, you know, stationary if you like. Uh, we would, you know, at first blush we think, oh, we have this by infinite chain of random variables. This is an I diagram you don't want to write down, can't write down. But instead what I'll do is just imagine the by infinite chain is broken into an aggregate random variable I call the past, an aggregate random variable I call the future. So then, well, I can use a two variable I diagram. Okay. So how are we going to do this? Well, the first thing is to sort of write down what the possible information measures are. Entropy of the past, entropy of the future, joint entropy of past and future, uh, uncertainty of the future conditioned on the past, mutual information between the past and future, excess entropy, uh, and so on. You can write these the whole things out. This might be a little mysterious. I don't know, what is this? Well, that's those two crescents, you know. <laughs> but what, what is that thing? Um, and then there are three atoms in this two-variable diagram. Uncertainty in the future given the past, uncertainty in the past given the future, and the mutual information between them. So you can probably already anticipate what, how simple the, the I diagram is going to be. So let's call that the future, entropy of the future, entropy of the past. This is the, this is like the predictive uncertainty given that I'm looking at the past, condition of the past, I've seen the past, what's my uncertainty in the future? Uh, this one is maybe a little bit sort of acausal, but anyway, we're allowing ourselves to look at the big chain. So there we go. We can talk about the uncertainty in the past given the future. Here's the, the excess entropy, right? The mutual information between the past and the future, shared information. Uh, now, what is this thing here that I noted before? Right, This is in, in the diagram. Whoops, too many animations here. Remember, before we looked at the sum of these conditional entropies here, and that before was some kind of distance, right? So those outer wedges or this quantity here is, is the distance between the past and the future. So that's all very nice and intuitive. However, I'm kind of pulling the wool over your eyes because it's very suggestive and helpful. It gives a little bit of insight. And, and Thursday, we're going to work on this process. Uh, information diagram in some great detail and pull out some interesting information quantities. And then basically next quarter we're going to expand this quite a bit to talk about state-based models and past and future and so on. And it becomes extremely helpful, but at least even here. So one of the problems with how I'm presenting it to you is that that is an entropy over an infinite number of random variables. It can be infinite. In fact, if the process is even a little bit stochastic, what's the information in realizations <laughs> semi-infinite realization from a, even a slightly stochastic process. It's infinite. So those circles, I drew them finite. That's not correct. But it's also not helpful to have them extend off to infinity. So we have to be a little bit careful. And there's, just, there's, there's a way of dealing with Really what I should have done is just talk about the block, random variables, and their entropies. Those will be finite for every finite L. Um, and then, you know, after you get some intuition about what's going on, and the relationship between the quantities from the information diagram, then you sort of write out your proof with finite L's and take the limits and so on. So it's kind of, you use the information diagram, get some intuition about what quantities you're working with, what the relationship is, but then when you write out, you want to make statements about what's going on, you look at block entropies and then take sort of the appropriate limits. Does it, does it matter that we have infinite entropies? Like uh, yeah, because sometimes uh, you, you what, there, are way, there are ways of answering questions where you are subtracting two infinities off and getting a finite answer and it's and that is just I mean you can still we'll, 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 we'll talk like that but you really shouldn't do it <laughs> okay because there will be cases I can tell you from first ex first-hand experience where you get completely confused so it, but it, it's okay to I, I mean like I'm what I'm trying to say is it's okay to use this as a first intuition but that's all it's helping you do and you really eventually have to write things out in terms and take limits and so on so even if you write them out as these are infinite sums, right? Well, the probabilities, and so if you throw them out in terms of that, you still end up Oh, with well, actually, a lot of the work we're going to be doing, we're not even going to worry about probability distributions anymore. So a lot of the, the, the 
conclusions we'll draw about how to measure structure in complex processes. We're not going to dip down to probability distributions necessarily. That's one of the benefits. We're now kind of staying up at this information level. Information is now our primitive as opposed to a probability of an event. There will be problems where I actually want to go down to the word distribution or some transition matrix. Well, we will do that, but um, this is so much handier. Again, just because we're using these scalar variables as proxies for the sort of flatness of these distributions, we can get a lot of mileage. Um, and sometimes it just prove things at this level that apply to probability without ever having to deal with probabilities. So, anyway, just, just kind of a heads up. We, we will be careful next quarter when we go through things to, to do this in most cases where it gets a little bit tricky. It's one of those slightly unsatisfying things where you have to, you know you have to be more careful and you work it all out and the result is exactly what you thought without doing it, but that's the way it goes. <laughs> so, just because there are those cases where it's confusing. So, so but, but let, me, let me kind of uh, drill down on this a little bit. Um, so, uh, okay, so we have these possibly complicated quantities here. I'm saying, well, okay, infinite futures, well, okay, we really should be thinking about maybe conditioning on a particular infinite past, that's fine, but then the entropy number here could be uh, infinite if it was the in semi-infinite future, so I'm gonna look at the block, uncertainty in the blocks given a past here. Well, but we know what this quantity is actually. Basically, it is uh, uh, this conditional entropy of the L block conditioned on the past. Since we are conditioning on the infinite past, we basically are already at the level where we can do optimal prediction and we know when we do optimal prediction, our next symbol uncertainty is the entropy rate. So, and also through stationarity, every one of these L variables is that uncertain. So, basically, this block conditional uncertainty just grows as H of L. So, we do know some things here. So, there's an infinity here, but this is exactly how it enters. So, that's easy to deal with. And this has a consequence for, for the information diagram call it foliations, right? So here's the previous information diagram. We're talking about this quantity here. Oh. Uh, right, so, so this is now block entropy. I'm writing this down. This diagram is now actually correct because everything's finite. And this, this crescent here scales with h well. Actually, we'll talk about this the next quarter. You can also talk about retrodicting the, pa the past here. Um, actually, I got these backwards. These should be backwards. That's the past. That's the future. So just swap these two things. But they both scale as h mu l. Uh, but more sort of graphically, the way we can think about this, now just look at one side here, is that, that block conditional entropy. As I increase l, you know, from 1 to 2 to 3, I'm adding on a sliver, a certain amount of entropy or information measure that is exactly proportional to h mu. And I'm filling out this big block entropy thing here with these slices, and I know exactly how big they are. So there's a lot we can start to say here that's much more structured. Okay. Um, well, so that's for three random variables, and I kind of step back and did the process uh, information diagram just to show how this can work and, and, and know some things. Um, what about for more than three variables? Well, <laughs> It gets harder. Uh, we can do hyperspheres, or we have all sorts of um, ways of forming these Venn diagrams, right? If I have four variables, four sets, you have to, the Venn diagram is all possible intersections and overlaps. Uh, we have roughly an exponential growing number of areas or atoms, and uh, you really can't do it for four or more variables in the plane. So here's one example. Um, and, and there's a small industry of people who sort of work through possible Venn diagrams, right? We have some choices in the shape. Sometimes for some problems, one shape might be more useful than the other. So you have X, Y, and Z like before, three circles. And now I have a new variable W, and this sort of sausage kind of loops through. There's a piece of the sausage that's just in W itself, a piece that overlaps just with uh, Y, just with X, just with Z, the pairwise overlaps, and so on. I mean, if you go through and figure out this is a fair, represents all possible intersections of the sets and top ones of the sets. Ah. <laughs> that's, that's too hard to work with. We've worked with that for a while. It's just too messy. Turns out, if you just get away from circles, 
something about symmetry, and if you're going to have a diagram, we just work with symmetry. So, so we, we, I'll show you some cases where we have four variables and use these ellipses in different ways. At least it's now nice and symmetric. Uh, it looks complicated, I admit, but there is a way to drive around these diagrams and makes more and more sense. So, so this will be the one that we'll use uh, like this. Again, satisfies the same Venn diagram requirements as before. <clears throat> or if you were, say, you had your fancy 3D immersive cave room, you could also do this in three dimensions. So you can. So here we can go back to the, 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 the individual variables being now spheres, not circles, but symmetric themselves. And then you have four intersecting spheres. I've been playing with this in our cave, and I don't I haven't quite seen the benefit of this. But you can stick your head inside these things and count the number of atoms. And so um, there might be a simplification here. I mean, there would be a simplification if, if, for example, there's a Markov chain between these. Then we go back to two dimensions. So depending upon the property, sometimes you'll get a, a, a great simplification in these. But the general case, I mean, this is just to give you some idea of, of how, how this would go. Okay, so now I want to talk, just to finish up here, to use um, some of this uh, to talk about various kinds of multivariable mutual information. Like mutual information. Turns out there are a number of reasonable generalizations of what we mean by shared or common information between a set of random variables. And they, they, they sort of, uh, the generalizations key off different interpretations of what we think the two variable mutual information means. So, um, so there are roughly, well, there are at least three. There, there are certainly more, but let's, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to talk about three. There are three generalizations. The first one starts off thinking that the mutual information is the common information that all variables contribute to. It's the, the I, X, Y, Z that we just saw in the middle of the, all the diagrams. Okay. So it's kind of this, this picture. It kind of starts from this identity in 2D. But there's also, if you remember, mutual information is, can be framed as an information gain or relative entropy between a joint and the product of its marginals. Right? The information gain between the joint and the product of its marginals. And that gave us some sense of uh, mutual information was kind of measuring degree of uh, dependence between X and Y. Uh, and then there's also uh, another interpretation that starts with a different identity. Again, these are all equivalent with two variables. So it's really, this is the extra semantics we've added when we, have, when we look at mutual information in different ways. So the joint entropy minus all this single variable unshared information, the, the information that just the variables have alone. Right? So it's, it's the joint entropy minus the, the, that part of X that's not predicted by Y and that part of Y that's not predicted by X. So we're kind of cleaving out all the, the variables, randomness that they generate themselves, and then uh, thinking of that as the shared information. Okay, so, so what I'll do is go through these in order and talk about the n variable generalization. And pretty much the main way we'll make sense of this is using information diagrams, because it gets a little bit hairy. Again, we're trying to deal with you know, all these possible unions and intersections of variables and the complements and so on. So there's, um, okay, so notation. I'm going to change the notation a little bit here because I want to talk about sets of random variables. Uh, in this case, you could think of this like a time series, but anyway, I'll just index these with a colon, zero to n. Be this set, zero up to n minus one. We have this sort of universal set over the indices, zero up to n minus one. A power set again, the, 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 the set, well, subsets of the index set here. Um, uh, if we have a, a set, a subset in the power set here, the complement is just that set, so minus the original set. So, so that's what A bar will indicate, just the complement. And then, again, if we have some subset of the index set, we'll have this indices I. And a real handy notation that I probably should have introduced it earlier is just that I'll put the index subset as the subscript. So this is a collection of random variables. Of, of those random variables i that are in that index subset. Rather than x1, x2, x3, that could be x sub 1 and 2. OK, so just to get started here, let's do something familiar. So the joint entropy, well, again, there's, there's no mystery here, right? It's just 
have the n random variables, we have a distribution over them, we just plug them into the P log P formula, and that's the joint entropy. But what I want to do is introduce this four variable I diagram. Okay, so we've got for the n equal four, that's when I sort of fix four. And I kind of straightened it out from the previous ellipse picture, but it's the same topologically as before. And then, um, so this is supposed to show us which atoms contribute to this number, to the joint entropy. In particular, uh, they all contribute equally. And so I'm using the grayscale here to indicate the number of times an atom contributes to this quantity. Later on, I'm going to introduce other quantities where we have different weightings like this. So it's very democratic, uniform level of gray here. All of these atoms contribute equally to the joint entropy. OK, so that's just to, to uh, get familiar with the four variable I diagram. So OK, so now here's the first generalization based on the notion of mutual information is the information all variables contribute to, that, that central piece in the I diagram. Okay, so what I'm going to do here, uh, I'll give a couple different, couple different definitions. So, so we're looking at now the mutual information of this block of random variables. And what I mean here implicitly is they're all separated by semicolons, right? But, um, and then what I'm going to do is look at all of the subsets of, in, of random variables. In other words, A is an element in the power set of the universal set. And then based on the size of the set, I'm going to add or subtract them. So hold on for a bit. We'll see why we're doing that. It takes a while to justify this definition. But let's do it in, 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 the, in the case of three variables here, 0, 1, and 2. So um, first I look at uh, the sets that are all singletons. Size um, should be a minus 1. No, sorry, minus 0. OK, so the entropies all come in with positive sign individually. And then the next step is to look at all the pairwise joint entropies joint entropies here, but I subtract those off because that's size 2, and then I get up to three variables, all of them in this three variable set, and I add that. So the signs are alternating here. So, so that's, that's what this means. Um, now, what you should imagine the exercise is, is you go back to the three variable I diagram and go through all the atoms and count them up this way. Put a one in all the individual variables, a one in the joints for the, and then subtract off a one for wherever there's a joint piece, and then add in a three way. And what you should find is that this definition uniquely captures I of XYZ, that central atom. Not obvious, but you can go through the diagram with yourself. There's a, another way to, to look at this, uh, essentially equivalent. We can look at the the joint entropy minus the uh, mutual information between the variables in the subset conditioned on knowing the variables in the complement of the subset. So what I mean here by this notation, just to spell it out, is if I had five variables, zero through four, one term up there would be x, one, two, and three, their mutual information conditioned on knowing x0 and x2. Uh, so this or if I had three random variables, well, it could also be a subset of the five random variables. I could have a singleton here conditioned on variable one, conditioned on variables zero and two. So that would be conditional entropy. OK. So again, you have to <clears throat> you look at this, and you should think, OK, what set theoretic accounting am I doing on my I diagram? The net result is, uh, without going through this slightly tedious, is that both of those definitions uniquely pick out that four-way shared atom. So at least we have now explicit expressions for what this is, right? I can go back to those different definitions and go back to calculating with distributions and so on, right? Those previous two definitions, I can rewrite those. Uh, but, you know, <coughs> hopefully the benefit is we can stay at this level as long as possible before we pull out a probability distribution and have to calculate those. Okay, so again, what are the properties of this particular generalization? Again, it's common information to, to which all variables, or in this case, all four variables contribute. Um, it can be negative, as we, we showed before for the n equal 3 case. Um, I, I, 
would say it's kind of hard to anticipate ahead of time in a given problem whether this is going to be positive or negative. I have yet to develop an intuition for that. Um, many of these things simplify in the time series case, which we're going to deal with on Thursday. Um, and the other curious thing is that if any two of the variables are independent, the entire sum, the, the entire mutual information goes to zero. So it's a little bit sensitive, right? Um, but, uh, yeah. Okay, so that's, that's uh, the first generalization, and I think it's the reasonable, it's the front runner in terms of what we would mean by multivariate mutual information. The other generalization goes back to this in relative entropy or information gain notion where you compare a joint to its marginals. Right? Um, so this is the expression here for what, what we call the total correlation. It's also been called the multi-information. I don't like that term. It's a total correlation. Um, even the word correlation here makes a little bit of sense because it's sort of comparing individual random variables to the joint. Like pairwise statistics before. Um, you can try to convince yourself, maybe it's, you can almost sort of see that. Uh, since this is log of a ratio, it's really the log, the difference between two logs. So we have a, the uh, joint entropy here shows up negatively, and then we just sum up the individual marginal entropies um, over atoms of size one. So we're sort of using the same notation. And then here's, here's the four variable I diagram. Um, so again, what it's doing is we have the joint entropy here, which would be all the elements, and then I subtract off the individual marginals. It takes a little while to do a counting. So, so there are different counts here. In fact, I've got that on the next slide. So if you go through and look at the terms in the sum, you know, there are atoms that have just one contribution to the sum, some that are doubly counted, and then others that are triply counted. So, so this, this, um, this particular generalization, it tends to overcount correlations, multiply count them. It gives you kind of a, a wrong, too high an estimate of how correlated the set of random variables is. Which sort of makes sense because it's just the joint versus the more individuals. There could be three-way and four-way correlations that contribute to total correlation, well, shared information or not. Um, it's positive, though, so that's nice. I mean, it should say non-negative. Also, if any pair of random variables, or I should say, if one random variable is independent of all the other individually, then it doesn't really contribute to this total correlation number. So there's just additional random variable. It's not correlated to anything. It doesn't change that. So at least that, that, that sort of makes some sense. But the main concern here is it tends to really overweight uh, certain so then this, this, this reduces to i to Yes, right, right. right. So all of these are, go back to, right, these so. Are, these are all i, those are expandable the dimensions. Right, right. They've got different dimensions. Exactly, right, right. So the way to think about it is, I mean, it's not so much that one is correct. These are tools, and the, the issue is, what's your question? And they're answers to different questions. They're different, they're different measures that have the same value in Two. Two right, right. They all come down. But we, we have these ways of, I mean, maybe in some way what we're doing, we've got more variables, we're realizing we had a lot of extra baggage we brought to the two variable case that we weren't, that we're kind of conflating. And now they're really very different kinds of questions that we're asking, could be asking. And then we have these different ways of measuring that. Um, okay, then, uh, then there's the, the, the third one. Uh, it's called uh, the bound information, and uh, we're going to use this a lot on Thursday. It's a nice, uh, interesting quantity for time series, um, um, but not in the time context. What it does is it's essentially, it's easiest to kind of explain up here with the I diagram. So it's sort of like the total correlation, except the atoms that are positive are counted just once. It doesn't overcount. Or the other way to think about it, it's, 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 it's the joint entropy everything minus those atoms that are just unto the individual variables themselves. Right? So, so the locally generated information, it's not shared with anybody else, gets subtracted off. So it's what's left over. So in the, in the temporal setting, we call this the bound information. So joint entropy minus the, the individual 
all the information generated, the X4 generates on its own and is not, that's not correlated with the other variables, all the information X3 generates that is not correlated with the other variables and so on. So. Uh, it's also positive, that's nice, and it also has the same property uh, that if it's, if, if a given random variable is independent of all the others, then it doesn't change. This quantity of some sense doesn't participate. Um, so th those are three different kinds of mutual information. Like on Thursday, they really are uh, answers to different questions, um, but very helpful in the time series context. Um, the, 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 the bound information is interesting because uh, the way we're going to use it is, um, it's, we'll think of it, uh, we're going to decompose the entropy rate, which we think of as the spontaneous amount of information generated in the present moment, and there are different components of it. Some of the spontaneously generated information is forgotten, but some is remembered, and that's going to be the bound information in the time series setting. People make the analogy with uh, the random events when you're listening to music, musical composition. Uh, for example, the composer just decides to change the key. That's a random thing that gets done at one moment in time, but it has an effect for the rest of the piece. So we'll, we'll come back to that uh, use of it. Um, but just to sort of finish up here, uh, some things we will end up using. Uh, there are other kinds of multivariate information. I'll just highlight a couple of them. One is the residual entropy, called the anti-mutual information. It's, we already kind of saw it before, it's the information that the variables generate on their own that's not correlated with anybody else. Well, I can just write joint minus the binding information, right? The binding information is all the white stuff, and I subtract that off from joint, which is everything, and I get these pieces, right? So you have a collection of random variables, they're generating stuff, some fraction of that is not correlated with anybody else. So, so that's the, the residual entropy, and this is gonna be important in the time series context I, I just mentioned, information, individual variables that's not shared in any way. It's anti-mutual information. Uh, and then there's a local, <laughs> local exogenous information. We're kind of running out of vocabulary here. But these different problem contexts are actually helpful. You might call this very mutual information. It's, it's, it's the information in each variable that only comes from its peers and it's not generated by itself. It's kind of complementary to the residual. Um, so here, this, the, the easiest expression is the bound information plus the total correlation. And here's the information tableau that sort of takes down the counts and the total correlation all by one. So, um, so it, this discounts for the randomness produced locally. So again, you can kind of see how these would be answers to different kind of questions. You want to see how much a variable is contributing to a process or maybe is not contributing to a process. So, um, I can't really imagine starting to you know, work with these things, but the, these information diagrams are critical to uh, extending these ideas and working with them in a constructive way. Despite my caveats in the time series case with infinite with things blowing up, still very, very helpful. Um, so, uh, that's, that's it for today. Um, next lecture is the last, so I'm going to talk about these ideas applied in the time series setting to get back to this entropy rate decomposition. And then um, part of a, the lecture will be about what's coming up in the spring, which is going to be yet another shift. We we're very close to, although it's a quick introduction to this kind of more modern information theory, we've at least haven't, you know, by, by Thursday we will have exhausted most of the tools that are there. Certainly they can be enriched and applied to many different settings. Um, Hopefully this will happen in some of your projects. Um, but there are also some issues and criticisms. Certain kinds of questions we can't address, even with all these extensions and, and all this kind of in, enriching our notion of the different kinds of information. So that'll be it for today.